afternoon and welcome nice. everyone and um, thank you so much for joining our, well, our webinar. Um, I've been told that we have 97 people that are registered for this. I'm assuming when I look at the numbers that some of you are gathered together in the same room and joining us in that way. But thanks to each and every one of you for joining us as we learn together about how to support you as instructional leaders in designing school or district plans for creating awareness, understanding and application of Indigenous foundational knowledge. As Christine mentioned, we most certainly welcome your comments and your questions throughout the webinar and we encourage you to share your thinking. We really want to hear what you are thinking or any of your questions, but um, by and large, um, we will probably respond to most of your questions if we have time at the end of the webinar, but otherwise I will send an email response to your questions and those responses will be sent out as part of um, the follow-up email to give you a link to this archive webinar as well as a link to the questions or the responses to the questions. So as you know, this webinar is one point one and a half hours um, and we will try our very best to get you out at uh, 5.30 because we know and appreciate the busy lives you lead and thank you so much for taking time to join us today. So my name is Corey Ziegler and I'm a facilitator with uh, Edmonton Regional Learning Consortium. I have been a teacher, I have been a principal um, and a director all with Edmonton Public Schools and uh, worked with Edmonton Public Schools for 38 years and now I'm doing this work and loving it. And so co-facilitating with me today is... My name is Crystal Sholin and I'm a learning consultant with Elk Island Catholic Schools. I still maintain a part-time classroom position also. As a learning consultant at Elk Island uh, Catholic, I do have multiple portfolios, one of which is Indigenous education. And so I'm well into my 25th year of teaching and uh, have quite a varied background between the three prairie provinces and bring quite a passion to this role. Great, and I'm so happy to be working with Crystal on this, um, uh, this webinar, but also just to share a little background information. Um, Elk Island Catholic Schools volunteered to work with um, the Alberta Regional Professional Development Consortium to pilot the planning tools that we're featuring in this webinar. Now Crystal, as you know, uh, works with Elk Island Catholic Schools and uh, that district um, and I are working together with three leaders, three administrators from the district. And these leaders have um, used the planning tools to assist them in designing comprehensive plans for their schools, um, plans to create awareness, understanding and application of Indigenous foundational knowledge for all staff but, um, in their schools, but also for the district as a whole. Now, you need to know, as you look at these plans later on in the webinar, that these principles worked under some very tight timelines and produced, considering their timeline, some absolutely amazing results. So before we begin, um, we'd like to uh, share our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place and traveling route to the Cray, Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Diné and Nakota Sioux. We acknowledge all the, first, the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. But we also acknowledge that um, this is a provincial webinar and so we know that uh, there are people here from Treaty 4, 7 and 8 territories perhaps as well. And so we want to acknowledge that too. Welcome to everyone. So for today, what we will be looking at the following outcomes. First of all, uh, reflect on your personal reasons for leading your school community on a journey of deepening awareness, understanding and application of Indigenous foundational knowledge. And it, we start with the personal because I, I believe um, this work needs to come from the heart. Then we'll reflect on your school or district's readiness for creating awareness, understanding and application of Indigenous foundational knowledge. Um, we'll learn about some planning tools. Those were piloted by Alcaline Catholic Schools. And these uh, tools can assist you in designing comprehensive plans, successful comprehensive plans, um, to create awareness, understanding and application of Indigenous foundational knowledge. You'll learn about some resources and supports that could be embedded into your school or district plan. And then you'll view some sample plans created by our three leaders from Elk Island Catholic Schools. So we have a very full webinar for you. Um, I'm going to share lots of slides to keep you interested and to keep you watching <laughs> and to keep you listening. So stay tuned. Uh, so creating awareness, understanding and application of Indigenous foundational knowledge is complex work. 
It can be fraught with emotions, with political agendas, uncertainty, and confusion. And I'm sure you're thinking about all those things already. Uh, before looking at supports and resources that will assist you as leaders in designing your plans, I think we need to take a step back and reflect on why this work is important to you personally. Becoming clear about your personal reasons for engaging in this work will serve you well as you lead this work in your school community. So with that in mind, let's begin our webinar by looking at what's in our heart and reflecting on why this, in work, this work is important to us personally. It is through our own personal passion and commitment for this work that we will truly make a difference. So we want to answer the question that's on this slide. Why should you create awareness, understanding, and application of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit foundational knowledge in your school community? And you can see this quote here from Heather, who is um, a speaker, a writer, a coach, and a facilitator. She says, my name is Heather, and more than anything, I don't want to be racist, and yet, there is one thing I know, and that is that reconciliation needs to begin with me. Before I can take part in the heal in the part of heal no, take before I can be part of the healing process, I need to peel away the layers of my own stories, find the seeds of the oppressor buried in me, and address them. And I think that speaks, you know, to the whole idea of why. So, um, to help you connect to your inner self. Um, I'd like to share a few perspectives that might help you become more clear in your own personal reasons for leading this work in your schools. I thought uh, we can start by listening to our Indigenous people and their perspective on this work. And I thought it would have been amazing and wonderful to have an elder open up this session for us, but that did not work out for today. And uh, just as a little bit of a side, I can't stress enough the importance of bringing our local Indigenous people into each step of the planning process to guide, inform, and inform our work. Instead, I thought I would bring the Indigenous perspective to you through a short uh, video. Um, and this video features Justice Murray St. Clair, who was the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Let's listen to what he says about reconciliation. And as you listen, reflect on what resonates with you. What does he say that contributes to or clarifies your personal reason for leading this work in your schools. And Christine is setting this up, and so Christine, take it away. Hello, everybody. I'm Hello, Murray everybody. Sinclair. I'm Murray Sinclair. I'm... Sorry, Corey, I'm getting some feedback. Can you mute your microphone? Chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about the issue of reconciliation, something which of course is very important to us here at the Commission, but also is of interest and importance to a lot of people in Canada. One of the things that we at the Commission have discovered is that it took a in terms of the relationship between Aboriginal people in this country. Seven generations of children went through the residential schools. And each of those children who were educated were told that their lives were not as good as the lives of the non-Aboriginal people of this country. They were told that their languages, their cultures were irrelevant. Pagans and uncivilized and needed to give up that way of life to come to a different way of living. At the same time that that was going on, non-Aboriginal children in and the non-Aboriginal school systems of this country were also being told the same. So as a result, many generations of children, including you and your parents, in, the, in a different way, in the wrong way, in a way that is negative when it comes to Aboriginal people. And we need to change that. It was the educational system that has contributed to this problem in this country. And it's the educational system we believe that's going to help us to get away from this. We need to look at the way that we educate children. We need to look at the way that we educate ourselves. We need to look at what it is that our textbooks say about Aboriginal people. We need to look at what it is that Aboriginal people themselves are allowed to say within the educational system about their own histories. In addition to what's important when it comes to looking at the way that children are educated is to understand that because it took us so many generations to get to this point, it's going to take us at least 
a few generations to be able to say that we are making progress. We cannot look for quick and easy solutions because there are none. We need to be able to look at this from the perspective of where do we want to be in three or four or five or seven generations from now when we talk about the relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people in this country. And if we can agree on what that relationship needs to look like in the future, then what we need to think about is what can we do today that will contribute to that objective. Reconciliation will be about ensuring that everything that we do today is aimed at that high standard of restoring that balance to that relationship. Oh. So, Justice Murray Sinclair said a lot of things, and you know, I've heard this video several times, and each time I hear it, he resonates with me in a, in a deeper perspective. Um, and hopefully you feel the same way. Perhaps his comments have inspired you to move forward with this work in your school. Uh, to me, every time I hear the video, I'm struck by that one question that he asks. Where do we want to be in three or four or five or seven generations from now? And that question has helped me to think about what it is I want to to come out of this work? What is my vision for this work? And why is this work important to me? So thinking about that yourselves as well. Justice Sinclair provided one perspective into why this work is important through his video. But perhaps looking at some Indigenous statistics may help you to clarify why you wish to lead this work. These statistics that you see on this slide here are based on the most recent data from 2011. I couldn't find the recent data, and I think this is still the recent data. Um, our, the Indigenous population, as you know or may know, is the fastest growing population in Canada, compri comprised of First Nations, non-status non Aboriginals, Métis, and Inuit. And so take a moment to reflect on the staff and the students who form your school community. Let's just make this personal here. Who are these students? How many of your students have self-identified as Indigenous in your school or district? And although this work is not about um, identification of our Indigenous students, it is important to recognize and celebrate our Indigenous student population. As Justice Murray Sinclair said in the video, our work is about leading our school community in aiming at a high standard of restoring the balance of the relationship with our growing Indigenous uh, people. And you can see that 6.5% um, of the Alberta population is Indigenous and growing. And so perhaps um, your reason for engaging in this work is because of the treaty information. Um, as we acknowledged in the, in the land acknowledgement, we have four treaties in Alberta. To what degree do your students and your staff, as well as the larger community, understand the treaties in Alberta and know about the history, the signing dates, the people involved and the complexities related to the signings? Knowledge and understanding of signing of treaties and the significance of these treaties will most certainly impact our relationships with one another and as we move towards reconciliation. How treaties are regarded, what significant treaties have with Indigenous people, and why they may tea are often overlooked in the telling of the story are topics that I personally believe need to be addressed. And so I love uh, the quote here, we all have the responsibility to teach the truth. And um, this, uh, this quote comes from a hairstylist, and I think, you know, really speaks to the whole idea of truth. You have to know the truth, the full truth, in order to have an opinion on it. In order to know it's wrong, you need to know what's happening out there. In my case, I didn't know about the truth until I was 16, and I felt betrayed by my school system, and how dare I take English? How dare I take history and not know the history that's going on in my own country? I felt so betrayed, and I think that's wrong. It should be in all books. It shouldn't be in Aboriginal studies. It should be in history. It should elaborate more and not just one paragraph. Get involved, stay involved, because people need to change. A very powerful message. So, um, We also look at the Métis Nation of Alberta and we, you know, one of the things that really struck me about this slide is the idea of settlements versus treaties and do we know the difference between the two and uh, what is the history. Then we look at our Inuit people in Alberta and that, that is, as well is a growing population and our Inuit people also were sent to residential schools 
in the in the fifties, and they suffered uh, the same indignities that uh, are the rest of our ind indigenous population did. And so, um, our history books have not always shared the truth. Learning the true story through the lens and in collaboration with our indigenous people may be the reason you are leading this work. We also have our residential schools. Uh, and the whole story of residential schools. We have 29 schools in Alberta. Um, Alberta had the most residential schools in all of Canada. And the impact of residential schools affects us all. And if you, as you think about it and you look at the impact here on this slide, um, a huge list of uh, the impact of residential schools. And as leaders, I think, you know, as you look at that list, you go, Wow, I see evidence of this in um, in our schools, and um, you know, again, make it personal. What's happening there, and uh, how is this um, uh, leading you to a reason for doing this work to create awareness, understanding, and application of indigenous foundational knowledge? I'm just uh, checking with my notes here. Sorry. <laughs> So, leadership as essential medicine. Successful school leadership is underpinned by the core values and beliefs of the leader. These values and beliefs inform the leader's decisions and actions. And together with the values and beliefs of other community members or other members of the school community, feed directly into the development of a shared school vision, which shapes the teaching and learning, student and social capital outcomes of schooling. And so, you know, you want to think about why do you believe it is important to build Indigenous foundational knowledge in your school community? And when I think of uh, why it's important to me, um, I think about my grandchildren. And I think about um, that for my grandchildren, they need to know the truth. They need to be able to have that understanding and that awareness and that knowledge to build better relationships and restore that balance that Justice Marie Sinclair speaks about. So over to you, Crystal, what do you think? Why, why are you doing this work? I agree with, with everything that you said, Corey. For me, it's, it's about our staff, it's about our, our students and our community to have a better understanding through knowing what the truth is because there is so much out there that people just are not aware of and the more they learn, the more surprised they are, I think, and the more it starts to touch their heart to that they, so that they want to change. I think through this work we can start to erase those stereotypes. We can build trust and hopefully we can move forward together with a, a mutual respect. Um, but again, the foundation of that is is knowing the truth and it's the only way to make a, a stronger community. Mm -hmm. Corey, as you said earlier in the, web, uh, the webinar, we had worked with three different leaders within our school division and one of the leaders had, a, I think, a really poignant quote that I'd like to, to read here today. This leader said, the new Teacher quality standards and the leadership quality standards allow my entire teaching staff to begin the conversation in a meaningful, purposeful, and systematic way. The new standard is now a requirement. This is not an individual PGP conversation with one or two staff members that may have a keen interest to learn and explore the Indigenous foundational knowledge required in order to lead their students. This is a provincial requirement that requires my entire staff to move forward reflect and determine where they are with their knowledge base in order to lead their students with an Indigenous and Catholic focus. I feel that it is important that we support our teachers in gathering the knowledge in order to foster Indigenous learning and appreciation of the cultures, worldviews, histories and current realities through a variety of activities, assessments and classroom conversations. I believe the approaches and tools that we're using will allow us to foster relationships that welcome, nurture and honour individual students' stories and cultures and supports the weaving of culture and curriculum to enhance the learning for all students. So it is a very personal journey that we're all undertaking and yet there is the provincial requirements that we do embrace it and I think if we can start with the heart then we're able to tie in to the requirements that we have as professionals to be able to work with this information. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks so much, Crystal. Um, I think, you know, to wrap this piece up, as leaders, you absolutely matter. What you say, what you think, what you do, as the leader, it's watched by each member in the school community. Your actions often speak louder than your words, and they all stem from your core beliefs. So being clear on your core beliefs and values absolutely matters. And, uh, you know, we ask that you really reflect on this. And we've spent a little time in this precious 
the hour and a half to talk about your personal reason for doing this work. And um, it is not a question I think you can answer right now. But take a little time after this webinar is over. Uh, spend some quality time reflecting and thinking about what is your reason from the heart for doing this work. And, uh, you know, Crystal talked about the TQS and the uh, LQS. And, you know, really it is another reason now. I would say it's not the only reason. And I think you want to get to the personal reasons first. Mm -hmm. But we are all expected to meet these competencies. And, um, you know, I like the quote here again. We need to shift thinking and attitudes, recreating them, uh, your thoughts, and putting them back in a good way. That's really what this is all about today, is recreating our thoughts, putting them back in a way, and moving forward with this. So uh, with that in mind, um, actually, if I just go back to this one more time, we also know that there is the TQS, and it has a competency as well that's around the foundational knowledge. Um, and our teachers are looking to us as leaders in terms of support, deepening their understanding before they can take it into the classrooms. Just as I think you as leaders are going, like, I need to deepen my own knowledge before I can lead in my school community. So having said that, um, ARPDC um, actually sent, uh, sent out a survey in March of 2017 and um, asked uh, principals, leaders across the province, um, how confident they were in their leadership abilities to support the school community in the two bullets that you see there, enabling all school staff and students to gain knowledge for the histories, cultures, languages, contributions, perspectives, and current contexts as well as de developing an understanding of the legacy of residential schools and the impacts of intergenerational trauma on learner development. And on average, 40% uh, of school leaders feel confident in their ability to support school staff, which on the flip side means 60% of our principals are not feeling confident to move forward. And so really, that's what this is about. This is about giving you some confidence um, to help you decide where to start and um, what are some resources that are out there. And Crystal's going to share with you a perspective from one of the leaders in terms of how um, that, that uh, leader felt in relation to the starting point. I think you'll resonate with that, with that comment. Just to give a little bit of background with this too, Work had been done in our district prior to this year, but it was somewhat where schools are working in isolation and with isolated supports. So there wasn't a consistent support system put into place. And this is the first year that we're working toward that. So this leader's comments, I think, reflect that that um, not not having that system-wide support system in place. So this leader reported, at this point of my Indigenous foundational knowledge, I, found it, I find it difficult to plan with a limited knowledge and in instructional leader within my building, I find myself out of my comfort zone. I feel that I'm part of the journey with my teachers, students, and staff in learning the foundational knowledge that is required. I will learn to lean on my community elder and Indigenous community for the knowledge to support and create our school plan. And really, when we look at the whole staff of the whole district, we do have that range in foundational knowledge, but there is a desire to do this work and to do it well, the concern comes in, are we doing it correctly and do we have the supports and the resources that we need? And I think that your, it resonates with you as you listen to that comment from that leader here in the district, um, that we all have that passion and the desire to be clear around what that is, is what we talked about initially. And now let's look at and how can we make this happen and be successful with that. And so a lot of times I get that question, well, where do I start? What is the first thing I should be doing? And uh, we want to back that up a little bit and really think about the readiness in your school or your district to begin this work. And so the question on the slide is, is your school or district ready to invest in the introduction or scaling up of the work to create awareness, understanding, and application of Indigenous foundational knowledge? And so we're suggesting um, that you consider readiness first. You have that article that you see on the slide here in your folder. And take some time later after the webinar to read the, the full article, but um, the next few slides will share some key ideas related to that article. Um, so um, readiness is defined as a developmental point at which a person, organization, or system has the capacity and the willingness to engage in creating awareness, understanding, and application of Indigenous foundational knowledge. And to me, there are two key words in that uh, quote. Uh, capacity 
and willingness. And so thinking about that, you know, creating that readiness is a critical component, both in initiating and or scaling up the work and is an essential starting point. Um, so readiness is often an underemphasized part of the implementation process. Resistance occurs when people are asked to prematurely move to action. So thinking about your school community, are they ready for action? And sometimes it's, they're not resistant to the change, but they're just not quite ready yet for that change. And proceeding with this work prematurely can lead to both ineffective and expensive implementation attempts. The authors of the article state that in some cases, um, leadership teams within a school or a district fully explore the change initiative, decided on a course of action without the engagement from a representative stakeholder group, including the local Indigenous people. And the same leaders and managers were surprised when collaborators, staff and colleagues um, experienced or demonstrated some resistance to change. So we really have to think about are we ready and are we engaging the stakeholders. So we can't simply say, uh, wait for readiness to appear. Um, in education, readiness for change is something that needs to be developed, nurtured, and sustained. It is not a pre-existing condition waiting to be found or an enduring characteristic of a person, organization, or system. So accountability for creating readiness rests with the leaders, not with those who are expected or invited to change. So scaling up requires recognition of a clear need for creating awareness, understanding and application of Indigenous foundational knowledge, and unless the needs are clear, the leaders and major stakeholders will not have sufficient motivation to fully participate in a multi-year process of changing education in classrooms, districts, and overall system functions. So uh, the, need, the need needs to be validated with data or broad consensus in order to stimulate sustained action and track progress toward the intended outcomes. And so what data can you or your district collect to stimulate action? How will you create a sense of urgency or a sense of readiness or, or a sense of, yes, I want to move forward with this? And Often this is where your personal commitment and your passion and your reasons for doing this work will help you to move forward. Crystal, um, I think your district gathered some data before beginning this work or as part of this work. That's right. When we gathered in the fall, I had a representative from each school join into an Indigenous COP and so we've been meeting throughout the year. But one of our first tasks was to lay some groundwork to find out what was happening in our district, what was the level of knowledge, what was the level of confidence. And so we created a survey that we sent out to all the all staff, not just all teachers, but all staff to sort of gauge their level of, of, um, of confidence. One of the questions we asked was related to the land acknowledgement. In many of our schools, we do read the land acknowledgement at a number of public forums. And we wanted to know whether or not people were understanding why that land acknowledgement was being addressed. And what we discovered was that approximately 10% of students and parents had an understanding of why we were using this, this uh, introduction to our public meetings. Staff was higher at about 50% saying that they understood why the land acknowledgement was there. Didn't necessarily understand all the background of it, but they understood why we were saying it. We also asked the question about the level of confidence in explaining truth and reconciliation. And we had about 30% of staff say that they had a good level of confidence with that. But then the flip side of that, of course, is that there's 70% who don't know or have no confidence or little confidence in, in talking about that. We found even lower confidence in knowing how to infuse Indigenous perspectives into the programs of study, as well as when or how elder or knowledge keeper support should be accessed, that we dropped down to about 22% of teachers an elder should be brought into the classroom in order to gain that full perspective. And ultimately we found out that a lot of the majority, the majority of work that was being done in schools was through one-off activities such as Orange Shirt Day. People were doing a nice job of introducing Orange Shirt Day but when it ended, it ended and there's no real follow-through, there's no consistent connection to deepening the knowledge and that was an area that we know that we need to build up and hence the the desire to, to start to build up that foundational knowledge across the board. 
Nice. So some, some great uh, data gathering there and really does point to where can we continue this work and where would we as a as a district or as a school align this work and, and build on it. Exactly. Yeah. So very nice. So thinking about um, as leaders then gathering that information um, about potential issues and you could see, you know, there may have been some potential issues there. You could read in between the lines. Yes. Uh, implementation methods, the risks, the benefits, um, in order to envision a future in which stakeholders demonstrate that awareness, understanding, and application. And convening groups at all levels of the system or the school, including elders and other Indigenous people, is an important first step. And the greater the diversity of the roles or function of these people in these discussions, the more complete the picture will be. Um, in terms of the challenges and the better you will be able to make decisions about an implementation plan. You need to hear voices, representation from all the different stakeholder groups. So as you begin your planning, who will you invite into your discussions? Elders, knowledge keepers would be important, but parents, community members, students, teachers, support staff. We need to hear all of their voices and they need to be brought into the picture. Um, interesting. Um, I hear that a lot as well as I'm not sure how you know what is the protocol and um, I will show you some resources later on on the Empower in the Spirit website to help you with that as well because that often is a bit of a, well I don't know what to do so I'm just going to wait until I figure that out. Yes. We can't wait. We have to get moving and there are resources to help you with that. So uh, this tool on this slide is one way to gauge your school's readiness. And the link to this tool is included in your folder. Um, but there are six elements that are listed on this tool. You'll see them there. Fit, need, capacity, resources, evidence, and readiness. Along with some key ideas and key reflective questions related to each element. This tool can assist you and your team in reflecting about where you believe your school or district is at in terms of readiness. And they kind of rate it high, medium, and low. And so you reflect on each element. You rate yourself high, medium, and low. And then um, there are numbers related to that, so you get a total score in the end. And the total score will give you an indication of whether you're not ready, getting there, or ready to go. And it's absolutely not a scientific score, but it is one that certainly generates some excellent discussion. And so, Crystal, share some insights in terms of the leaders in your district and, and what happened with that. The comments that I gathered after the process that we worked through was that most of us, well, all of us, because it is visual, it allows us to see and understand what areas require attention in order for change to happen successfully. We could see immediately what low scores were there, so they could flag those areas that we needed to address first. It gave us a starting point, right? Um, we felt it would be really useful to use with all of our staffs in order to establish a process. Because this work is so huge that having a tool to determine a starting point gives you a sense of control because you know what areas you're ready in and what areas you need to develop. And one principal specifically uh, reflected saying, uh, I'm looking forward to using the Hexagon tool with staff as a means to continue examining our current conditions in terms of readiness to change and what things we need to consider as we move forward. So it's a simple document, but it's very powerful. It gives you an immediate sense of where you can begin. And I think it's also the conversations that come out of that that yes. are so mm -hmm. um, enlightening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, using a tool such as this, as well as the conversations, the surveys that you are using, um, you are now ready or in a better position to begin planning how to build Indigenous foundational knowledge. And so teams need to anticipate, anticipate the risks in, involved and have a plan, and that's this whole planning piece again, uh, to manage risks, issues, and surprises that inevitably emerge from the change process. And, but this is an important piece as well. Any plan for change should assume that schools have some practices already in place that are valued. And uh, change should supplement what already works not supplant efforts that are valued, working for some, and hard won. And you heard in Elk Island, um, they're, they're working on the land acknowledgement. Let's build on the successes that are happening there and then go deep in that area. It is the great vehicle to get you to your planning. So um, what can help you with the planning process? Well, this resource on this slide 
uh, provides guidance in designing a comprehensive plan for creating awareness, understanding, and application of Indigenous foundational knowledge. It has a really long title, and I'm not going to read it to you, but it is really a planning and implementation tool. Um, you might recognize it. It is included in your folder, but this resource was created in response to requests from leaders across the region. Um, you will see that it's familiar because if you know the guide to support implementation, the essential conditions document, the green one shown on the slide here, um, this, this resource that we were using with Elk Island Catholic Schools um, is aligned to the essential conditions document. It is an excellent, comprehensive, and well-researched planning and implementation tool. And because the essential condition document was so strong, this Indigenous planning document was aligned after it because we know it would result in success. This document has, um, is um, supported by some guiding principles. So first of all, recognizing that diversity exists within school communities this Indigenous planning and implementation tool is not intended to pres uh, prescribe a spe specific approach to implementation planning. And how we wish we could have this kind of step-by-step -step approach, a silver bullet, and we'd all get, it, get this work done. Well, um, that's not going to happen. It's a reflection tool. It asks some guiding questions. Um, and it is based on the idea that, as uh, Justice Murray Sinclair said, it will take time and needs to be based on local context. So it offers guiding questions to support implementation planning that intentionally addresses each of these seven essential conditions that I'll share with you in a moment. It also offers suggestions for what might be used as evidence that the essential conditions are being addressed. And gathering evidence and celebrating those small wins is critical to moving forward and often informs next steps in planning. And so addressing the essential conditions, um, as we have said already, it's important to collaborate with the community and uh, to reflect on the guiding questions and then employ strategies, procedures, and processes to assist in identifying who will be responsible for what, by when, and at what cost. And as you start building your plan, you start to see, oh, Crystal's responsible for this. Oh, Crystal's doing this. Oh, Crystal again. And so you want, <laughs> the beauty of this document is that it becomes visual mm -hmm. and you start to see who's doing what by when and it gives you a really clear sense of direction. And then again, that whole idea of establishing evidence to assist your community in knowing that the essential conditions have been addressed. And so here they are. Here are the seven essential conditions. Uh, shared vision, leadership, research and evidence resources, teacher professional growth, time and community engagement. And uh, the conditions are interrelated and no six. Each condition must be addressed if you wish to have successful implementation. And I show this slide quite often because I think it is just such a great visual in terms of how they're interconnected and how if you miss addressing one essential condition, success is not as evident. And so if you look at this one, if all the pieces are in place with an action plan, it equals change. That's the top row. But if you're missing vision and everything else is in place, you end up with confusion. People keep saying, why are we doing this? What's the point of this? And so vision is really important. If you miss the, miss the professional growth for your leaders, for your teachers, for those stakeholders, you end up with anxiety. People are worried and our principals have said that. I don't know this myself. How can I lead this? So we need to offer the, the learning, the opportunities for our stakeholders to reduce. If we miss the research and the evidence, that the research-based practices, the evidence, which is the data collection, we end up with gradual change because we're not sure if we're being successful or not. And if we miss the resources, that's time, resources, community engagement, we end up with frustration. And finally, if there is no action plan at all, you have false starts. It's hit and miss. And we heard Crystal talking about that already, where it was an isolated incidence of this, but not an aligned, cohesive moving forward. So those false starts. So what does that document look like? The uh, implementation tool um, actually is quite um, similar as you go through it. Each essential condition is dressed, addressed in the same way. 
So let's unpack the shared vision essential condition and take a look at it. If you have the resource in front of you, that's great. If you don't, don't worry, I have the key ideas on the slide again, and you can go back to that resource later. It is in your folder. So uh, each essential condition includes a descriptor of the condition, the current state, a where are we now kind of reflection, guiding questions, a planning template, and then evidence um, of success. And so if we unpack those a little bit further, you can see that when we look at a shared vision, um, it really, it takes time to read the descriptor because it does really deepen your thinking around, okay, where are we going with this? What, what should we do? So when a school and a school authority leaders demonstrate a shared vision and a commitment to develop awareness, understanding, and application of Indigenous foundational knowledge within the school community, this vision is evident in the school authorities' policies, so it's talking district level there, in the plans and procedures of the school authority district-wide as well as school plans, and in the culture and practices of schools and classrooms. So the next section of um, the planning tool talks about your current state and reflection on that. So uh, are you creating a shared vision and who are you engaging in that vision? And you can see you're just beginning, you might be on the road, getting closer, or keep it up. And it really talks about the different stakeholders in this. A couple other questions around the current state. Are you aligning your shared vision? Um, is it aligned with your three-year education? Your schools are in the district. This is an important piece because we know the complexity of the work. We know about the competing initiatives and we need to to have a sense of that and build that into the plan. Is our plan too heavy? Is it, do we need to uh, stretch out our timelines because we have so many other things happening? And so we really need to be thinking about that. Uh oh. Hmm. And so I, not sure what to do here, Christine. Oh, goodness. Do you see it? Okay, sorry, I think maybe I might have to get a little closer to the mic. Um, so then a commitment to the shared vision. School and school authority leaders are working collaboratively with all stakeholders to create conditions and pro provide the necessary resources to develop awareness, understanding, and application. Um, and so this one is about how clear are you in communicating the commitment uh, to your vision. And I think it's always a great little litmus test to talk to anybody and say, why do you think we're doing this work? Mm -hmm. And it really tells you how clear you are around communicating the vision. And how are you in vision around this work? And so great reflective questions there around your current state. And you can dig deeper because there are guiding questions to help you to go a little bit deeper with those. I won't read those all to you. <laughs> but certainly um, take a look at them because they spark your thinking. It helps you to go deeper in terms of that work. Then you have a template there uh, to help you begin your planning. This is an, an example of one template. Um, and you know we, we've offered you several here in this webinar because we all know you have different styles in terms of writing. And so this is a who is responsible by when and resources needed um, in relation to the shared vision condition or essential condition. Um, and then you look at examples of evidence and I love this part because it, again, triggers ideas for you. You go like, maybe we need to be looking for that. So it's really great in terms of examples. And then what you need to do is develop your own examples of what it is that you expect to see here and people understand as you're moving forward with this work. And so when you see those things, it's again that idea of celebrate those small wins. This is complex work. We need to build in those celebrations of, yes, we're moving forward. So um, this slide here is a suggestion, and I know that each one of you as leaders approach planning and implementation differently based on your local context and based on your leadership style. This slide offers some suggestions. They're pretty basic. Feel free to revise in any way uh, you think is uh, going to work better in terms of your context. But certainly consider what is already in place. How can I build on that? 
then you know using that hexagon tool or the reflections in the uh, implementation tool what still needs to be done and list those strategies and processes and procedures um, and decide then when will this be done when is it reasonable and who will take the lead and the responsibility again being cautious of how much responsibility one individual can take on link that to the resources that are needed and again, a reminder, resources are finite and do a few things well. And then establish that evidence. So that's a quick uh, kind of step-by-step -step process. I lied. I said I wasn't going to give you that. But it does kind of give you a bit of a start in terms of how you might begin this work. In your folder, you have another sample template. And this one um, takes a different approach. It talks about foundational understanding, strengthening, and then enduring success. I love this language, and I, I would love to say that I coined these phrases, but I didn't. We borrowed this from Edmonton Public Schools. It is their language on their planning template. And so if you like the language on this one, feel free to use this template. Uh, this one is more aligned to the uh, document that I shared with you, and it breaks it down by year. So in year one, we'll do this. In year two, we'll build on it. Year three, that would be the sustaining piece. And so your plan, if you don't like those templates, you might want to write a story or create a visual. I know that some of us are great around those concept maps or mind maps, um, a painting, an artifact, um, what works for you. So having said all of that, um, we'd like to now move into, and so what are some of the resources that we can use in our planning? And ARPDC has created a wealth of amazing resources. And they're all housed on this website, the Empowering the Spirit website. The link to the website you'll see on the slide there. This is only a screenshot. Um, and the first thing you kind of notice there is that um, e-course. I put an arrow there, a yellow arrow beside that e-course. It's new. Um, there are spring and fall and winter sessions of this e-course. And they have been very well received. And if your staff or if you personally would like to begin your learning by engaging in this e-course, it is open 24-7. It offers it as a self-paced uh, study and really is quite comprehensive in terms of learning. You'll also notice other tabs on this website, foundational knowledge, experiential learning, professional learning resources, and additional resources. I just wanted to point out a few of the resources that are on there through the next few slides here. The first tab is foundational knowledge. And uh, you can see that each one of those blue titles there are links to more resources. So if you want to learn more about Métis people or Inuit people or the historical perspectives, just link to those. You'll find amazing resources. The legacy of residential schools, treaty education, ways of knowing, all kinds of resources there. The last one, though, I do want to focus in on a little bit more. Those are the conversation guide series. And here's a screenshot of the first page and the last page of one of the conversation guides. Um, these guides, uh, these, this, it's a series of 11 conversation guides. And they're national leaders and learning communities or as a self-paced study. And the guides give each reader parts of the truth that lead, to individual, that lead individuals and groups in the direction of reconciliation. And so you'll see that there's some content there for groups or individuals to read. And then the last page always has questions, sorry, questions for reflection and discussion. And as well, uh, for more information, additional resources, should you want to go deeper in terms of your learning in any one of those topics. And so they're a great resource. They most often, if you share this at a staff meeting, you could spend maybe 30 minutes to an hour engaging in some really rich conversation. And it is a great way to perhaps start uh, building that um, understanding and awareness of Indigenous foundational knowledge. This is the next tab, Experiential Learning, and offers some um, great uh, resources to, let's say, host a family night in your school if you'd like to host an Indigenous family night. Uh, several schools have, have uh, done this, and they're offering their insights into how to do that step by step in terms of the work. If you want to uh, do the blanket exercise in your school, the scripts for the blanket exercise are there, including a student script if students want to lead that work. If you'd like to engage in the Métis jig and uh, um, enjoy some dancing, there's, uh, there's that as well. So all kinds of great resources there. 
So take some time, go through the Empowering the Spirit website because they are certainly, um, the resources that are there are vetted, they're, um, they are the truth, and they've been uh, also supported by our Indigenous leaders. And so feel free to use those resources in knowing you're sharing the truth. Any comments about that, uh, Crystal, in terms of the resources? No, they are very they are very rich, as Corey has said, and it does take time to go through them to find the information that would be most applicable to your situation. But they have thought and included such a vast uh, array of ideas there that it is well worth the journey to to work your way through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the next tab there uh, is about the professional learning resources. That's for you as uh, um, educators. All kinds of of things there. I'm not going to go through them all, except to say that. I absolutely love the Seven Grandfathers Teachings mm -hmm. website. It is so visual um, and the way they kind of transition from one idea to the next is very powerful. So have a look at that. And so now, da 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 da, <laughs> <laughs> we want to share with you some of the living Indigenous educational plans created by Elk Island Catholic Schools. And we have three plans to share with you. But before uh, we share the plans, I do need to say on behalf of all of us, and I'm including all of you that are participants, um, express our deep appreciation for these three leaders. They demonstrated the courage and the confidence to share their work in progress, all in the spirit of learning. And absolutely, um, as you look at this, it is a work in progress. Um, and it is not our place to judge their plan, but to learn from them. What you have in your folders in terms of those sample plans is their first attempt to create an implementation plan. These plans reflect alignment between district work and priorities as well as local context. You will see that each plan has some very unique elements and yet each plan also outlines some strategies, processes and ideas that are common across the district. Real nice alignment there. You have to know that these instructional leaders were very nervous about putting their draft ideas out there. But from my perspective and in talking to them, I said, this is the real deal. And this is what makes it so meaningful. These plans reflect the true nature of the work, complex, emotional, political, and they take time. The fact that they are not complete reinforces the authenticity and organic nature of this work. So uh, the plans as you, um, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at them because we sent them out on Friday, but they reflect ongoing meaningful and rich conversation with key stakeholders. Um, the instructional leaders were intentional, intentional about engaging the key stakeholders. They used the hexagon tool. They asked selected guiding questions from the planning tool. Uh, they engaged in self and group reflections around the responses to those guiding questions. They engaged in ongoing conversations with their elder and so much more. What you see on paper does not tell the full story, but simply the results of the story thus far. These plans are living documents and living plans that will continue to evolve. This is their first attempt to put ideas about how to build and apply Indigenous foundational knowledge onto paper. The front page of each plan that's in your folder provides some information about the school. And as you re review the plans, I think it's important to consider context. What works in one school may not necessarily be meaningful for your school and what you might do there. So your school may, may be much further along in the journey, may have a different starting point, and on the other hand, you may be in a similar place. I'm confident that as you read the plans, you'll deepen your understanding of how to effectively lead the creation of a plan. It is not our intent to walk you through these plans, uh, but simply to share the entire plans with you. So you can see how the essential conditions have guided their planning, but yet offer flexibility to you as leaders to work through uh, the plans and create plans that are meaningful and reflect your context. So our intent is to invite you to review these plans on your own time when you can give it your full attention and not just a cursory glance. But having said that, we know that you know that we'll share a little bit and Crystal's <laughs> going to share a few details about the plan to entice you to read further uh, when the time is right. As Corey had said, uh, the plans are organic and they are constantly here in a few moments. Um, do keep in mind that each of the leaders came to this work with very different backgrounds in terms of their level of foundational knowledge and their level of experience with Indigenous uh, culture and Indigenous education.
reflected in the plans also. We had made our connection with, with Elder Teresa Strawberry only late in the fall, about November we made our first connection. And as the leaders were coming together to start to look at this work, we had only had a few interactions with Elder Teresa, but having her in the room and ha hearing her perspective, I think really impacted the leaders in terms of what they felt they could do and felt more confident in having um, a very valid resource able to come out to work with each of the schools. So when you take a look at the plans, when you have that opportunity, you'll see that they do look quite different from one another, both in their format and then the level of detail. The first plan I'll reference is Madonna Catholic School. So it is a kindergarten to grade four. That school has approximately 183 students in it with approximately nine self-identified Indigenous students. They created their plan with a three-year timeline in mind. Uh, they identified very specific plans in relation to the physical space of their building, how they wanted to utilize different areas, resources, but also how they would develop resources tailored to their needs. And connecting with Elder Strawberry, you'll see referenced several times over the course of the plan. They wanted to do that in order to create that enduring success. The principals actually indicated since the plan was submitted that the plan's already changed. Mm -hmm. uh, the work, because of the work that they've already done, they've accomplished several of the goals already indicated. And right now the plan they believe will be able to come to fruition in two years. So there's a perfect example of how this is a living document. In, in the short time that it's been submitted, they're already planning to change it because they can, they can see that they were already moving on. The next plan is Holy Spirit, which is a, a kindergarten to grade 8 school and much larger population, well over 670 students with 33 self-identified Indigenous students. That school created their plan simply with a one-year timeline. Uh, it featured again a greater number of targeted connections to Elder Strawberry and a focus on building up that foundational knowledge for the staff and for the school community. Collaboration opportunities between the district schools and other jurisdictions are also identified as ways to build resources and strengthen the school where they're looking to build foundational knowledge across the board, coming in with maybe a little less experience and wanting to make sure that the whole school moves together in, in building that awareness and in building that knowledge and certainly creating those connections between the school and other resources is a target that they want to be able to accomplish. The third school is St. John the 23rd, and it is a grade four, no, it's a K to four school. Hmm. And it has a population of 433 students with 27 self-identified Indigenous. You can see that that plan follows a very different format to develop ideas within a one-year timeline. The plan features a really strong emphasis on utilizing the land acknowledgement as an interactive foundational piece to create awareness and understanding, as well as accessing accessing professional development opportunities to build staff confidence and competence with their foundational knowledge. So they plan a series of interactions with that land acknowledgement so that it becomes very well embedded within students understanding and comfort and they've got they have some really interesting activities planned for that. But they've also identified the ongoing building of a relationship with Elder Strawberry and on and collaboration opportunities within the community. So each school is approaching their plan with a slightly different focus and yet a consistent theme running through all of them is that awareness of connecting with Elder Strawberry and, and other members of the Indigenous community so that the voice is authentic and the work is supported and it is going to be true to what we want to be able to do. Thanks, Crystal. And you know, I was reflecting as you were talking about the three schools in our first meeting that we had with the three principals, mm -hmm. Crystal, myself, and Elder Strawberry, um, so critical to moving this work forward. Yes. It, to have those conversations with the elder, um, she she gave us insights, she shared her thinking, it was so powerful. Mm -hmm. And I think all three leaders walked away going, oh, I'm so glad that happened first. And every subsequent uh, interaction that we've had with Elder Teresa since then just continues to, to deepen that understanding of what we're doing and how we should be doing it. And so I think each of the leaders were tremendously grateful to have such a, an extended period of time to chat with her and to, to gain her perspective. So if you can build that into your initial planning, I think that is a strong way to go. Um, the local elder brings that local context to it and helps you to shape your planning mm -hmm. around, okay, what is it we need to plan around for this area, for our region? And so the, I can't speak enough to the power of bringing our Indigenous people to co-plan with us right from the start. So um, having said all of that, 
um, there are some reflections and suggestions from the three leaders that um, they would like to share with you. And so we actually asked them questions around, okay, so how did you find the planning tool? Uh, what were some of your successes? What are some of your challenges? And so in relation to the planning tool, they found it valuable to speak to the Indigenous persons, just as we just finished saying, right? Mm -hmm. um, at the very beginning of the process. And that conversation, they said, was rich. And again, uh, the next uh, bullet is around Elder uh, Teresa again, Teresa Strawberry. And uh, the conversation took, took these leaders to different discussion points than what was originally planned for the meeting. And that was so true. It was like, wow, that went really <laughs> in a different way than what we thought initially. But it was the right way to go, right? Um, and that being said, more time with these larger group meetings would have been helpful. And so I think what this leader is saying, to have time to collaborate with leaders in your district is also very powerful. Have those conversations and create that alignment from school to school across the entire district. Um, ask those questions, share the ideas and the experiences that are happening in other schools. Make those connections, visit each other's schools, learn from each other around what's happening there. Mm -hmm. Very powerful. Um, the leader said a key piece of be, uh, to beginning this project and moving forward was having a very specific shared vision and goal in mind. Instead of looking at all the possibilities of what we could do, can we relate to that? Because we're all going, you know, I got a thousand and one ideas. Um, examine what we are currently focusing on and expanding what seemed to be the most logical fit. We don't want to overwhelm everyone. Think about what's logical and what's working well already and build on that. So she said, he said, I can't remember now, it gave guidance to our next steps as, we, as well as continuity within our present work. A dedicated amount of time is certainly needed for this project and finding this time as well as personal personnel within the building to assist in this planning was difficult. Being really honest about that and being prepared for that. We started off with Justice Murray Sinclair talking about this will take three, four, seven generations. And uh, I think as leaders, we always want to get this work done tomorrow. We're going like boom, boom, boom. We want to have it done. This takes some careful thinking, some careful planning, uh, reflective conversations, um, and um, we need to plan for that. So the tools, talking about the hexagon tool and the implement. This leader said the current state questions were helpful in reflection and the guiding questions and the examples of evidence were helpful in understanding what action items we could consider for our school's plan. It made the plan easier to create with the ideas that were set out in each page. So again, you know, we said that before, but it does spark ideas for you and it helps you go a little bit deeper. Another leader said, I appreciate, I appreciate the where do we go to ensure that all the conditions were considered in planning each step. Another honesty here, I found the table too tight to work in and found myself moving away from the document in order to write out my thoughts. And we talked about that. Everybody's style is different. So find a style that works for you and your team. Um, Again, when using the planning docu document, at times we did feel we were going in circles. Be prepared for that. However, we knew we had to stick to the process. We were true to the process. We went through the planning documents, read them out, and discussed them. And because of that, we have a plan and a direction for our school. So we found the tool valuable. We are now very confident in the direction that we are going. And finally, this is not easy work. You do need to dig in. We utilized the hexagon tool and did note our limited knowledge as a staff. It does give you that sense. Mm -hmm. And it does help in terms of direction, in terms of your planning. Complexity. We asked about the complexity of this work. Did you want to talk to these ones, Crystal? Uh, sure. <laughs> I'll just read them through and then comment on them. Um, after our meetings with the three principals, the elder and the ERLC consultant, the FNMI lead and I sat together and we spent four hours going through the process and coming up with the plan. We still need to share the plan back to our staff at the next staff meeting. This plan cannot be done in isolation. Approach the plan collaboratively. And hands down, uh, because I do work still in a school along with my consultant position, I was part of the planning at, at one of the schools. And absolutely, it can't be done in isolation. You can't go and sit in an office and think that you can just hammer this thing out yourself. You need to have those conversations with other people to know what their perspective is. And when you get all the ideas coming together and you've got the voice of the elder guiding you, then that's how we're able to make a 
fruit. Um, one of the other leaders did mention our plan will take up to three years to implement, but we believe we can do it in two years. We've already changed the timeline. Flexibility is important. As you digest your plan, and you begin to think deeply about aligning the work. So sometimes I think we don't give ourselves credit for how much work we have done, but it does take recognizing that, and really we can't recognize that until you have the opportunity to take a look at that. And this particular leader, they were able to, to see how much they've actually been able to accomplish already, and hence the fact the change in their timeline. So the tips and strategies that they have suggested is primarily to set aside time. It really came down to time with your planning team. We need to take that time in order to make it valuable because you can't just throw it together. It is an evolving process. You think you have some ideas down, but as you work your way through the tool, you realize, oh, you know what, let's go back and rethink about that. And so it, you need to be prepared to, to put that time into it and not get frustrated because um, you know lots of ideas will come out and you need to make sure that they're aligned with, with the goal that you have in mind. And uh, finally, what was especially helpful was writing a current state statement for each area that clearly outlined what we have done and what we're currently doing at the school. Because it gave a clear direction as to what our next steps would be. You really need to know that. Before you can decide what you want to do, you really need to know where you're at and what you have accomplished or what you haven't accomplished. And so understanding that present state is able, that's what enables you to be able to make a plan for the future because you have a starting point. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and we don't want to scare you off saying, well, this is going to take a huge no, amount no, no. of time. <laughs> that wasn't the intent, but really to plan and begin now to be thinking about, yeah. okay, how are we going to start this and who are we going to engage and set aside that time, which is why it is one of the essential conditions. Time is an essential condition. If you don't put the time, uh, set aside the time for that and make it dedicated time for planning, your success will not be as strong. So absolutely. So. As a wrap up then, we've covered <laughs> off a lot today. You know, I'm going back to the outcomes that we shared with you at the beginning. And so we did spend some time reflecting on your personal reasons for leading this work in your school community. And um, you know, we said start with the heart and bring those people with you that also start with the heart because that is going to move the work forward. That will give you the commitment um, and the uh, strong desire to move forward with this work especially when you come up against challenges. You need to have that heart there with you. Um, we reflected on a school or district's readiness for creating awareness, understanding, and application of Indigenous foundational knowledge, and, and it is a critical first step. Are you ready? How do you know that you're ready, and what do you need to do to get readiness in place? Mm -hmm. We learned about the planning tools that may assist you in designing comprehensive plans, and uh, we had some reflections on the use of those planning tools as well. Uh, we shared the Indigenous resources through the Empowering the Spirit website uh, that you can use, that you can embed in your plans, and we talked about the strength of those resources and the wealth of those resources. And then we viewed some sample plans um, by the leaders here in Elk Island Catholic Schools. So I uh, shared a lot with you today, um, uh, and we hope that we, you found this um, webinar worthwhile. Um, it is only a starting point for you, obviously, and it is my hope that you'll take some time after this webinar to read through the resources that are included in the folder that was sent out to you. Um, they will most certainly value add to your understanding of how to lead this important work. And then you must begin. <laughs> <laughs> so just uh, to wrap it up, as mentioned earlier, this webinar has been recorded um, on the SPIRIT website. Uh, feel free to go back and revisit this webinar at any time. And both Crystal and I wish to thank you for participating in this webinar. Uh, we wish you all the best as you begin or continue your journey to create awareness, understanding, and application of Indigenous foundational knowledge in your school or across your district. You'll see contact information there at the bottom of the slide. And feel free to contact either one of us of the leaders of the three plans that were shared with you today. Uh, just go through Crystal and she'd be happy to arrange that for you. So thank you again for participating and best wishes as you move forward. <laughs>